Archbishop Mark Holdridge, welcome. Thank you very much, Donna. Nice to be with you. So tell us about the early years, where you were born, where you grew up, the family, etc. So I was born in Melbourne. I was the third of five children, so, right. but I was the third son. So by the time I arrived, they were sick to death of boys. <laughs> <laughs> then as I was beginning my... Uh, primary schooling, we, my father was moved to Adelaide on business. He was basically a salesman. Mm -hmm. We were in Adelaide for seven years. So back, in, back to Melbourne we came in 1960. Uh, I was always a smarty at school, but I'll never forget a Christian brother um, who taught me in those years. He's now dead, brother Vin Monigle. And he was also the one who introduced me to cricket. I hadn't played cricket much when I was very young, a fact at all, except in the backyard. But Brother Monigle got me playing cricket. Now, cricket became one of the great passions of my life, and it remains so even in my 70th year. I matriculated when I was 15. Oh, I think of it now. And I could have gone to university uh, because my results were good enough and I got a Commonwealth scholarship, but I stayed on to do what was then called a second year matriculation, the last year of school not for any academic purpose, but because I wanted to play sport. Left school and went to the university. I did uh, an honours arts degree at Melbourne University in English and French. The only career I had in mind was a diplomat. Now, I look back and I think, why the heck did I think of being a diplomat? Travel? I think it was, tra <laughs> yeah, I think it was travel, the romance of being overseas. Yes. So anyway, about halfway through my university degree in Melbourne, I... Um, I thought, I don't want to be a diplomat. And it was about this time that I met uh, two or three young priests in and around the University of Melbourne. Uh, two of them were students living nearby. One of them was a kind of a chaplain. And these guys made a great impression on me just at this time. Um, and I saw in them something of the priesthood and, and even the church that I'd never seen before. And I have to say, I found it quite exciting in a way that surprised me. And uh, eventually I decided to apply for the seminary. And it was at that point that I, I remember telling mum and dad, I could still see the scene in the lounge room at home. And um, I told them that I had decided to go to the seminary. Well, my father, who at that time smoked a pipe, just about swallowed the pipe. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. My mother, of course, mothers are cunning, they're smart. And she, she sensed that there was something up. So she wasn't too surprised at all. But I can remember too, a couple of days later, telling my, her mother, my grandmother, who was a very sort of devout Irish Catholic, and I can still see her face. She just turned to me like this and said, I've always prayed for that. Oh. I thought, my God, <laughs> there's a plot. So off I went on the 22nd of February in 1969, uh, very uncertain as to what I was actually doing and wondering whether I would survive in the seminary and all that stuff. Well, from that day until this day in 2017, mm. long time, uh, I've never doubted that it was the right decision or that I was in the right place. I was ordained priest in 1974 at the age of 25. When I think about it, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I thought I knew just about everything and when I look back at 25, what do you know? Um, well, you know, some things, but there are a lot of things you don't sure. know. So after about five years in three different parishes, uh, the Archbishop at the time summoned me and said, listen, I want you to do some study. And I said, oh, that wasn't a real surprise. But then I said, what do you want me to study? And he said, well, I want you to study uh, the Bible. And I said, but I don't know Greek or Hebrew. <laughs> and he said, we, don't, we know you don't, but you can learn them. And, and that's what happened. When I look back on it now, it was one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given, is the, uh, the call to study the scripture. So I, uh, off I went to Rome to study at the Pontifical Biblical Institute, and I, I was thrilled at the opportunity, the th living overseas and Rome and all that stuff, and I was, what was I, about 29, I suppose. Well, they wouldn't have been into cricket. <laughs> the Italian cert although there was an Italian cricket team. I played cricket in Did Rome, you? yes. I, I played for a crowd called the Doria Pamphili Eleven. The Rome years, I had four years there as a student and um, th they, were, they were often tough years but they were the, among the richest years of my life, I've got to say. 
And then once I finished there, I had six months in Jerusalem. Amazing. That was amazing. Well, Jerusalem is an addictive place. Every time I've left Jerusalem, I say, good riddance. And every time I come back, I think, what, how wonderful to be back. It, it's, it's a unique place. It's crazy in many ways. But it is one of the great essences of the world, mm. I think. And, uh, and such an important part of our church. Absolutely. And, and it's in it, the DNA of everyone who happens to be Christian. So anyway, having completed my studies over a fairly long period of time and in some ways become, become a different person, certainly grown up, it was the end of adolescence for me, sure. those early 30s. Uh, you know, a slightly painful time of growing up, basically. And then uh, I came back and began a career that felt very much to be my real career, and that was teaching. Son of a salesman, but I, I discovered that I have a gift for teaching. And I loved it. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed the students, journeying with them through a semester and even seeing them learn. It's a great experience. Mm -hmm. And teaching the Bible is a huge privilege. And... Uh, the other thing I discovered was the best way to learn is to teach. Anyway, then again, I, after four years of teaching, I, the, the bishop said, go and do your doctorate. So I ended up back in Rome and um, was there for another three and a half years. So by this stage, Rome really did become second home. Uh, then I returned again to teach, was made master of the theological college. Uh, I was thinking at the time my life has moved in directions I never imagined it would in... Uh, when I was ordained, it had turned out so different. Well, little did I know that just around the corner was another offer or call that I absolutely didn't see coming. <laughs> and that was when the, uh, the, the new archbishop said to me one day in the car park at Melbourne Cathedral, how would you like to work in the Secretariat of State? So at the end of 1997, I went, uh, I went to Rome, back to Rome, but I entered another world. See, there are many Romes. Mm. Uh, I'd known student Rome and thoroughly enjoyed it, but I had never known Vatican Rome, the curial Rome, as they call it. So I worked in the Secretariat of State in the private office of the Pope, I think we'd say these days. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, so I lived in the, uh, and worked within the Vatican, which is the gilded cage. It, it, it's a strange world in some ways, but I can remember one night walking through the Vatican gardens and which are very beautiful and I heard the sound of children playing and it was the altar boys from St Peter's playing soccer just around the corner in the gardens. I thought to myself how incredibly refreshing mm -hmm. to hear the sound of kids playing because as a priest in Australia with our schools you hear the sound of sure. kids. Like my house here in Brisbane, Weinberg, has got a school in it literally in its backyard and I love the sound the of the kids. The laughter is wonderful. Yeah, isn't just it? The, the music of kids playing. Uh, sometimes people say, oh, it must get on your goat. It doesn't get on my goat no. at all. I love the sound of, of kids playing. So I think it was that night when I heard the, the altar boys playing football, I thought, wow, you know, this is a different world from anything that I've ever known. So again, I got a, a surprise call from one of the Pope's key aides and who called me down to see him. So he's pulled out a folder and said, uh, you may be surprised to learn, or there, there again, you may not, uh, that the Pope wants to appoint you Auxiliary Bishop of Melbourne, which was a surprise, I have to say. Um, and after four years in Melbourne, I was, I was asked to go to Canberra yes. as the Archbishop, where I had six years. Now, they were, again, good years, but different, totally different. I mean, Canberra wasn't quite my place. So, but I thoroughly enjoyed the country parishes and, and most of the diocese was rural because I'd, I'd always been a city slicker, you can tell. But I... Uh, so I, you went to Cooma and places Cooma, like... Cooma, the Monero. My hometown. I know, the girl <laughs> from Cooma. She came to Brisbane, saw a palm tree and melted. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, but West Wyalong yes. and Goulburn and uh, down on the coast, Naruma and the Sapphire... Beautiful. It's a fascinating diocese, that one, because it's where do you want to go today? It's got a bit of everything. But, but it was my first real exposure to country Australia, and I loved it. And then after six years in Canberra, uh, I was asked to move further north. I, they kept moving me north. 
to come to Brisbane six years ago now, almost six years, and uh, someone said, next stop, Thursday Island. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, um, but as soon as I got to Brisbane, I have to say I felt at home. Good. And uh, I, I, Brisbane is my kind of place. There's a friendliness in the DNA that I have never struck in a big city anywhere. And you don't get it down south. You don't find the same quality in, in Canberra or Melbourne for all of their other strengths. You don't find that. Well, you are very busy. What <coughs> do you do when you have spare time? Like, how does the Archbishop chill? <laughs> <laughs> I'm post-chill, really. No, I, I, uh, I don't get a lot of chill time. But, uh, look, one of the things for me now is to get a free night where I can just ha hang loose at home. You know, read a book or, uh, you know, watch the cricket. Yes. And, uh, no, I like, sport is still a great interest of mine. I, I occasionally go to a football game here. And I've, I grew up with AFL. What team do you support? Oh, Bulldogs. No, I, uh, but I, in Canberra, my Canberra years, I was kind of rugby-fied. Yes, I, with I, the Brumbies. The Brumbies and also League, of course, with the yes. Raiders. The yes. Green Machine, Good don't boy. forget. yes. So by the time I got to Brisbane, I was well and truly primed to be a Broncos boy. Good. To say nothing of the Reds. All right, a Christmas message. Well, look, it's always the best of times and the worst of times, folks. I mean, in some ways, the world looks in atrocious shape at the moment. There's all kinds of things going wrong. And also in the church, I have to say, as a bishop, you're usually dealing with problems and crises. And sometimes you think that's all there is. Now, Christmas, I think, is the moment where you stop for a moment and you think there's more to it than the bad news. There's more to it, when I say it, I mean life. There's more to the church than the problems and the crisis. They're all there. But, uh, but there's so much more out there that, that is a cause for that mysterious thing we call joy. Now, it's, a, it's an often joyless world. And I know that as much as any of us. But, but so much more is possible. So I think Christmas is a time just for seeing more. Uh, beyond all the bad news, that there's good news that's as simple and as beautiful and as deep as the newborn child. And your hopes for 2018? Well, I, I think my first thought would be to, to hope that it's a bit more peaceful than 20. 17 has been because uh, 2016 was, you know, for me as Archbishop, it was a pretty demanding year, a bit rugged. A lot of things went wrong and 2017 I was expecting to be a little calmer but it's been, if anything, a bit more rugged. Now again, if you don't like the heat, get out of the kitchen. Sure. Um, but, and there's nothing else I'd rather be doing. But I would like to think that uh, 2018 is, uh, you know, is a year where less goes wrong. That might be a naive expectation. But I'm also deeply, deeply involved in our journey towards what we're calling the Plenary Council here in Australia, where we look to move beyond the Royal Commission and all that that's brought to uh, a spirit-filled planning for the future of the church in Australia. Always a pleasure to catch up with you. Merry Christmas. Thanks to you, Donna, for many things, and Merry Christmas to you and everyone who might be watching.